we thank you for your presence in this place. Inhabit the praises of us, your people, God, because we love you so much. And today we worship you in spirit. And we worship in truth. Say, I do. Worship. I do. Worship. Your love, I do worship. I do worship you for your goodness and your glory, for the joy inside your story. Oh, We live. 
lift our hearts and declare out loud, saying, Lord, I love you. Lord, I love you. Amen. Amen. All praise the Lord. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, choir. Thank you, praise team. Thank you for ushering in a, a spirit of worship, praise, prayer, and supplication to our God. Uh, out in the parking lot, there is a Honda, a Hyundai Sonata, tag number 1BD5240. It's a gray Hyundai, Hyundai Sonata. It's parked in the rear lot, and you left your hazard lights on. You might want to take care of that. <laughs> A Hyundai Sonata tag number 1BD5240. It's gray parked in the rear lot and you left your hazard lights on. I want to take time right now, you know, just to thank um, the ladies who led us in worship, Miss Jean Glover in prayer, Miss Margaret, Mrs. Margaret Roy in the responsive reading, and Mrs. Joanne Britton, even though she didn't pray this service, of course, uh, she was uh, here at the 830 uh, service. It's quite a quite a commitment, but I want to thank them. And uh, to me, it's just an example that we are all uh, ministers, every single one of us who has the spirit of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ living on the inside of us. We have been called to be ministers of our God, and we can pray anywhere, we can read scripture, we can worship the Lord. Not only can we do that, but he's given us gifts in which we can be a blessing to the body of Christ as well and to our community. My brothers and sisters, I would like for you at this time to turn in your Bible to Mark Chapter 11, you know, I've been dealing with faith now for quite some time. Uh, Mark chapter 11, uh, we're going to look at verse 12 again. You ought to be familiar with this particular portion of scripture, but there's always something that we miss every time, something we miss, so we have to go back sometimes and get it right. Praise the Lord. If you stand for the reading of God's word, stay on the screen if you don't have a Bible or you don't have a Bible app. <clears throat> Yeah. Mark chapter 11, beginning with verse 12, from the word of God, NIV version. And it says, the next day, as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. Seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. Then, of course, Jesus went on to Jerusalem. He got to the temple. Things weren't like they should have been. And there were merchants selling in the temple and enriching themselves off of the people's desperate need for God. And so he began to turn over the money, the tables of the money changers. And he turned over benches and he made a wreck of the place and he drove them out. He says, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you've made it a den of robbers. Let's pick up in verse 20. Jesus left Jerusalem at that point. Now, verse 20, he's going back. In the morning, as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you curse is withered. Jesus said, have faith in God. Truly, I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. May the Lord bless the hearing, the reading of his holy word. Let the church say amen. Now, because I have gone over this scripture uh, before, I'm not going to talk about the fig tree. Uh, but, but what Jesus did was of monumental importance to us. Let's go to God in prayer. Turn to God, our Father, we're thankful, Lord, for your presence, for your goodness, for your love, for your tender mercies. As you say in your word, your mercies are new every morning, and we celebrate you today, your work in our lives, your goodness to us. We just pray, Lord, that we might bring ourselves in line with your word, in line with your will. And so even as Moses ascended on the mountain and he took off his shoes, he humbled himself and he bowed down before you. Likewise, Lord, we bow down before you and we ask that you would speak to us right now in the name of Jesus. 
Let church say amen, amen, amen. Uh, the subject of our sharing this morning is how to have mountain moving faith. You can really say it's mountain moving faith part two because three weeks ago, that's what I talked about. And in between that, I talked about great faith. They're all related. Subject of our sharing this morning is how to have mountain moving faith. When we talked about great faith on last Sunday, I said that genuine faith in God, even in its smallest form, is a living force that is stronger than anything in the material world. And every believer in the Lord Jesus Christ has it. Now, I said this because Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew, the 17th chapter, which is really another version of Mark, the 11th chapter. Jesus said to his disciples, he says, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, he said, you can say to this mountain of olives, move from here to there and it will move. And he said, nothing will be impossible for you. And so again, genuine faith in God, even in its smallest form, even when it's the size of a mustard seed, is a living, growing force that is stronger than anything in the material world based upon what Jesus himself said, because Jesus said, faith that size can move mountains. And what's amazing to me about all of this is that Jesus was really trying to show his disciples how to do the things that he did. That's what he was trying to show them. He said to them, he said to them in the text, he said to them, he said, if you say, not if I say, he said, but if you say, if you pray, if you have faith, if you ask anything in my name, if you abide in me, then you will be able to do far beyond what you think you can do, what you think is possible. Basically, Jesus was saying, Jesus was saying to them, I have already learned how to do these things, right? I have already learned how to do them, but if you have faith in God, if you listen and if you obey my words, then you can learn to do these things as well. Now, I realize even as I speak that it is quite possible that you believe that you've been told that you have thought patterns in your mind that have set limitations and that have set a ceiling on what you think you can do with or without God. We all have those. I have those limitations. You have those limitations. There are limitations in our minds. Even when we read scriptures like this. Preachers up here to speak preaching. Everybody's like, well, you know, Reverend, I don't know about that. But I'm here to tell you. I'm here to tell you the word of God wants to break through those barriers. It wants to break through those limitations because Paul himself said in the word of God, he said, I can do what? All things through Christ who strengthens me. You might say to yourself, really, Paul, can you really do all things? Can you? Paul will say to you, yes, I learned that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And if that's not enough for you, the word of God says we are more than conquerors. Through him who loved us. Paul said that in Romans 8 chapter. If that's not sufficient, Paul went on to say, he said, all things work together for the good. To those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. And if that doesn't move you, Paul said again, he said, if God be for you, then who can be against you? So you see, my brethren, the word of God. The word of God uses language that seeks to stretch us beyond the limitations and beyond the barriers of how we have been taught to think. Beyond our mental barriers, right? That's why Romans 12 chapter verse 2 says, says, be ye transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. That's why 2 Corinthians 10 chapter says that as a believer, you, you have to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. He went on to say you have to tear down mental and philosophical and even religious strongholds of the mind that are in your mind that are dead set against you knowing and experiencing God in this life like you should. Why? Why? Because, because you can be saved, my brothers and sisters, and still have a mindset that is worldly and carnal, more worldly, and more carnal than it should be. In other words, you can be a Christian, and you can still think like the world does. 
because you never paid attention to your thought life and you never submitted that thought life to the word of God. And because of that, when that is the case, you can only advance so far in your relationship with God because you have areas in your minds and in your heart that are not properly aligned to who he is, right? So in your heart, you know, you can believe in Jesus, but in your mind, you can have some unrenewed areas. And because of that, at times, you can live a divided life. That's what Paul talked about. Remember when Paul said in Romans 7, Paul said, you want to do good, but you don't do it. You want to believe in the word of God, but you just can't see it. And so there is division within yourself. And when you are divided in that way, it is very difficult to have or to maintain mountain moving faith. Now, now Jesus said, in order to have mountain moving faith, he said, you have to speak to your mountain. That's what he said in the text. You have to speak to your mountain you have to speak to your issue or your problem or whatever it is you're facing. Now, this applies to everything, my brothers and sisters. It applies to your finances. It applies to your relationships. It applies to your jobs. It applies to the goals that you've set for yourself, your health, your trials, your family, your issues of depression or anxiety or dealing with past hurts or failures. You can do this if you apply the word of God to your life. You can overcome all those things. Now, I'm not trying to oversimplify this. I'm really not. Because I know that many times we doubt. I know many times we say, I don't understand how this works. But Jesus more or less demonstrated and he flat out tells us that there are times when you must speak to your mountain and tell it what to do because of your authority as a son or daughter of God and because you have the right to use the name of Jesus and his name is above every other name so that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. His name is above whatever you are facing. You can, you can put a name to whatever it is you're facing and his name is above that and you have the right to use his name. I can't get into the authority right now, but I can tell you this. There is a way of life. There is a life of faith in God that gives you the power to speak to something so that God's will can and will be manifested in your life and it can be seen. The Bible says that Jesus spoke to the fig tree. He spoke to the fig tree and he said, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And within 24 hours, the fig tree died. And Peter, in essence, said, he said, how did you do this? Jesus said, Peter, you need to have faith in God. As a matter of fact, he said, as a matter of fact, not just this fig tree, he said, you can speak to this mountain and tell it to move and it would obey you. But Jesus said, to do this, you must believe and not doubt in your heart. And that's really what I want to get to this morning because I have overlooked that little section right there, the doubting part. Look at what Jesus said again in verse 23. Look at what Jesus said again in verse 23. He said, truly, I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart. Wait, 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 let me go back. If anyone says, not just you, Peter, it's amazing, isn't it? If anyone says to this mountain, if anyone says to their finances, if anyone says, speaks to their relation, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea. And does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, Jesus said it will be done for them. Isn't that something? So now to have mountain moving faith, first of all, you got to have faith in God. Secondly, you must speak to your situation. And thirdly, Jesus says, you must not doubt in your heart, but believe that what you say will happen. In other words, Jesus is saying, don't trivialize faith. Huh? You know, Jesus said, you can say all kind of things with your mouth, but if you don't believe it, it's not going to happen. And that's something you can say all kind of things. People can front. People can be hypocrites. They can say one thing and mean another. But you can say all kinds of things with your mouth. But if you don't believe it yourselves, it will not happen, huh? 
Don't say Jesus and don't say or confess things that you don't mean or you don't believe. Say what you mean and mean what you say. Let your yes be less and let your no be yo. And no, and think about what you say before you say it. <laughs> you know, I, I thought about, I, I told this at the earlier service, but you know, there were some guys, I grew up in a neighborhood here, and there were some older guys that uh, took a liking to me, and sometimes I would try to hang with these guys. And uh, one of the older mothers, their mothers died in the, on the street, and so uh, those guys were out there on the lawn, and they had, a, uh, they had a case of beer, and that beer was in the cooler. And so there was a guy there who I didn't know. He was drunk. And he kept trying to talk to me. And the older guys, they were trying to tell him, say, listen, man, he's a minister now, man. He's a minister. You don't need to say all these things. So the guy kept talking, kept talking. And one guy put his hand in the cooler. The guy started saying something to him. He put his hand in the cooler. He got the beer out. He said, think about what you say before you say it. And that killed the conversation right there. He said, think about, he had had enough. Think about what you say before you say it. That is what Jesus really is saying to us. Think about what you say before you say it. You know, you know, some people like to talk just to be talking. Some people like just to hold the floor. <laughs> but Proverbs 10th chapter says, in the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. But he who restrains his lips is wise. <laughs> Listen, my brothers and sisters, Jesus says, Jesus says, when you say something, when you declare, when you command something to happen, and if you don't doubt in your heart, but believe that what you say will happen, it will be done for you. Now, the question, if you're like me, the question is, how can you not doubt? <laughs> how, how, how can you not doubt? Well, I don't think that Jesus means that you can't ask questions because you genuinely want to understand something. I don't think Jesus meant that at all. As a matter of fact, Jesus, if you notice in the scripture, Jesus entertained and he answered many questions from his disciples and from people at large. But I believe Jesus is saying, he's saying when it comes to doubt and when you speak to your situation, he's saying do not doubt the goodness of God. Don't doubt the mercy of God. Don't doubt God's willingness to help you. Don't doubt the character of God. For example, God has already demonstrated how much he wants you to succeed, how much he wants you to prosper, how much he wants you to be victorious because he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for your sins. So don't doubt God's love for you. Don't doubt God's character. God wants you to succeed more than you want to succeed. Isn't that something? That's the nature of doubt that I believe Jesus is referring to in this text. And, and you, you don't really have to so much doubt yourself even. And you really don't, you don't really have to doubt yourself or doubt your faith because number one, your faith ought to be in God and not in yourself. And number two, the faith that you have is a gift from God. So technically it's not your faith in the sense of whether you have enough faith or not. Many times we encounter this, we want to, do I have enough faith? It's the faith that God has given you. Now I'm not saying that you shouldn't put forth any effort, that you shouldn't take ownership for the faith that the Lord has given you, uh, because, but the faith that you have, you need to recognize that it is a gift to you from the Lord. Your faith doesn't originate with you. It's not a quality that you had. It's not something that you were born with. It's not something that you worked hard for, but rather it's something that needs to be nurtured or something that you should be a good steward of or something that should be used to the glory of God. You say, Rev Reverend, I don't understand what you're saying. You know, Ephesians, we talk, Ephesians 2nd chapter says, it is by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. The faith that you have, God has given that to you. And he's given each one the same measure of faith. But it's how you cultivate that faith. It's how you work that faith. You know, all of us have biceps, but some of our biceps are more pronounced because we go in the gym and we work out, right? All of us have faith, but some of our faiths, are more pronounced or stronger than others. Why? Because we work that faith. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Huh? Huh? God gave you faith so that you could move mountains. Jesus was talking about in our text. God gave you faith so that you can defeat the enemy 
who is at work in your life. God gave you faith so that you can rise above, rise above the corrupt culture of this world and rise above a tame, faithless, religious culture that wants to satisfy any and everybody. God wants you to rise above that, huh? God gave you faith so that through it, he can enter this world and set wrong things right. Huh? Isn't that what the prophets did? Isn't that what some of the kings did like David? Isn't that what Jesus did? Isn't that what the apostles and the disciples of Jesus did after he left? See, their faith in the Lord enabled them to overcome all kinds of challenges and it liberated them so that they could be powerfully used by God. So now, if you, want to, if you want to increase your faith, uh, if you want to um, cultivate or strengthen or grow your faith, however you want to say it, since your faith does not come from you, then you have to increase it by coming more familiar with the Word of God. Romans, the 10th chapter, verse 17, tells us how we receive faith in the first place. It says, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the what? By the word of God. So you cannot separate your faith in God from the word of God, right? And the word of God is really the main thing that can develop within you the mountain-moving kind of faith that we see here in this text. And the word of God. Is what will renew your mind so that what Jesus spoke can become true in your life. Now, I can't, I can't today, I'm not going to address all of that today, but I just, I just want you to understand that God gave you faith. He gave you the faith of the Lord Jesus Christ. He deposited that faith within you so that, so that you could do the impossible, so that my brothers and sisters, you could move mountains. The Lord would not have put this in the word if it were not so. The Lord would not have put this particular text and others like it in the word if it were not so. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? So I'm saying to you, my brothers and sisters, if you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you are a son or daughter of God, you have mountain moving faith living on the inside of you. But when you go to God and when you speak to your situation, just don't doubt that God is for you just don't doubt in the mercy of God or the goodness of God or the willingness of God to help you and see you prosper and see you succeed and see you be victorious in this life you have mountain moving faith living on the inside of you amen the doors of the church are open the doors of the church are open, and uh, we invite you to become a part of us, not a perfect church, but we're striving to be all that God would have us to be. And so, if you don't have a church home, join us. Uh, if you have never given your life to the Lord, we want to invite you to do that right now. If you give your life to the Lord, He will systematically, area by area, change your life for the better, and you will never, ever be the same. Let's stand.